Welcome back, everybody. If you're new, my name's Nicholas, and this is Investing Against the Grain. In today's episode, this is a tribute, a thank you to all the Tesla bears out there. Most notably, we're going to get into the mind of one particular Tesla bear, Craig Irwin, even though he may not actually be a bear and he just doesn't know it yet. In today's episode, we're going to unpack an interview that he had with CNBC with regards to this new um, beat that Tesla just had with deliveries and then, of course, with the stock reaction up about 13 or 14 percent yesterday. All right. Phenomenal, phenomenal price action yesterday, even better than what I could have hoped for. I'm sure you as well. We essentially closed at twelve hundred dollars and early indications in the pre-market shows that we're going to break past twelve hundred, which is a psychologically very important barrier to break. So with that said, you know, we're going to more or less not so much bash this Tesla bear or, you know, criticize him in a negative way, but it's going to be more of a critical analysis to understand why we keep getting these amazing opportunities to invest in a Tesla and why the majority of people still don't understand Tesla and why for us as Tesla bear or Tesla bulls, excuse me, or better yet, not even bulls, just people who understand the company have such a long way to run still. So again, to all those Tesla bears out there, thank you. You guys are the ones making us uh, wealthier and wealthier every single day. With that said, do me a favor, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, ring that bell, and let's get into it. Joining us now, Craig Irwin from Roth Capital Partners. He currently has a neutral rating, uh, but a share price target of $250, obviously well, well below uh, the current price of uh, around $1,200. Craig, good to see you as always. F first and foremost, <laughs> how surprised were you by that, that delivery number? You know, I think everybody was surprised by it or else we wouldn't have seen the uh, 13, 14% move today. Um, you know, I thought it would be strong, but that was really pretty shocking. Um, you know, I remember not so many years ago where we wondered if they would do 40,000 units. Um, and now they beat by more than 40,000 units. That's, that's, that's just an impressive result. So before we even just dive into this, do you see what I'm saying? How he has a price target of $250 per share, a neutral rating. And yet listen to what he's saying. It's nothing but glowing statements, right? Just talking about how impressive Tesla was. It wasn't even a couple years ago, we were wondering if they would even make 40,000 vehicles and now they're beating by 40,000 vehicles on delivery numbers. Like it's, it's right off the bat, that just shows the entire juxtaposition of him between his, his price target and the words coming out of his mouth. It's very confusing. And by the way, not everybody was shocked by the delivery numbers. Some of us were pretty dead nuts accurate. That's why you should check out my models whenever they come out. Let's continue. And, and, and clearly with your share price target, Craig, of, of $250, you think it is going to significantly revalue to the downside. What, what, what is the trigger, the catalyst that leads to that? So the way that I'm approaching it is I have a neutral rating, right? I'm not calling for a sell. I'm not calling for a short. I'm very clear to say I wouldn't short it. I think they're going to continue to beat expectations. There's levers that they can pull for, um, for growth, both the mini car, the entry into India, or things that I've been talking, actually, talking about for actually over a year um, that are going to deliver upside versus analyst estimates over the next number of quarters. So the rationale on the $250 price target is simple. It's that Tesla is egregiously overvalued. You know, you look at the company, they, they did just over 900,000 units this year. And Toyota did, you know, what, uh, 9 million? You know, they did 10% of Toyota, but they're, 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 they're valued at a trillion dollars versus 300 billion for Toyota. There's no reason that Toyota can't develop compelling EVs and have those in the market and maintain mm -hmm. their dominant position globally. You know, just like the rest of the automotive OEMs, you know, there's nothing intrinsic about Tesla that's going to stop these other companies from successfully introducing compelling models. And that's why we've been ringing the bell saying 500 EV models on the road by 2025. Many of those are going to be very successful and very interesting to consumers. So much to unpack here. So much. So I'm going to try to remember it all in my head. First things first. Wait. Craig Irwin is doing, which is very confusing for most people because this isn't how it's normally done. He's got a $250 price target on the stock, but then dis disassociated, decoupled from that idea, he has a neutral rating. So what he's saying is that he would not short the stock, and that's why he has a neutral rating. 
If he had a sell or anything of that nature, he, that would indicate that he wants to sell the stock or short the stock, right? But so he's saying, no, I don't think you should short the stock. I think it's going to keep going up. And the reason he has a $250 uh, price target on it is because he thinks that Tesla's grossly overvalued. Okay, so hold that thought, right? Those are decoupled. Okay, normally your price target and your rating tends to be, you know, aligned, right? Coupled together. In this case, Irwin is not, and he's not very clear on how he how he is going about this. So just want to, you know, clear that up for everyone. Now, he talks about how Tesla has all these levers that they can still pull in order to have a lot of room to the upside. Again, he sounds like a, a Tesla bull, right? But despite the price target, despite the neutral rating, he has a very bullish opinion that it's going to continue to go up, which is just confound, right? It makes no sense. So with that said, let's talk about what he mentioned when he said levers. He talked about the, the mini vehicle or the $25,000 vehicle. He talked about expanding the, in the India. This right here is the first sign of somebody who doesn't understand Tesla. What he sees as levers to pull for Tesla for them to continue to go higher is the 25,000 vehicle and expand to India. Now, he's not wrong. Those are levers. But then he follows that up by saying it's grossly overvalued. Well, listen, Craig, the reason that you're, miss you're not understanding this is because you're missing all these other things. You're missing full self-driving. You're missing Tesla insurance. You're missing the energy. You're missing the supercharging state. Like you're missing all of these things within it. Like full self-driving alone has three categories within it. Three categories. The first, full self-driving is for all of us, right? Everybody can have it. They can use it in their own personal vehicles. Two, robo taxis. Think Uber, think Lyft. And three, the idea of licensing this software to other auto manufacturers. That's three different huge total addressable markets that don't even exist today within the Tesla model. This is what people aren't understanding. This is what Craig doesn't understand. Now, now this I had a, an epiphany last night. I, I believe to truly understand something, you have to have the ability to give it, explain to someone with an analogy or metaphor. And I, I love a good analogy or good metaphor. And last night, I kind of had one come to me with regards to what he was talking about with Toyota and how Toyota has a order of magnitude more sales or 10x more sales than Tesla does. Toyota sells about 9 million vehicles right now. And Tesla only sells about a million. And he's sitting there talking about how, you know, this just is add up. And that's what he's using for his rationale for the $250 price target. Now, let me explain to you my analogy here, my metaphor. To say that Toyota with their ICE vehicles is selling 9 million and thinking about just from a unit's perspective and comparing that to Tesla would be like me telling you, hey, I've got this Motorola flip phone and Motorola is selling 9 million Motorola flip phones every single year and Apple's only selling a million iPhones. It makes no sense. Why Apple's overvalued. They are not the same. They are absolutely not the same. I think you would all agree. A, a, a Motorola smartphone flip phone is an archaic piece of equipment. A ICE vehicle is an archaic depreciating asset. It's something nobody wants. It's not the future and it's going backwards. On top of that, gas prices are soaring through the roof. Nobody wants ICE vehicles anymore. The demand isn't there for ICE vehicles. However, Tesla has essentially a software on wheels product, a, a product that everybody wants and every single auto manufacturer is trying to get into, yet they can't. And so that goes into my other point where he talks about how nobody else can really get into this or anybody can get into this market, right? He acts like Toyota can just flip a switch and, and they're there. No, again, not true. They don't have the manufacturing ability. They don't have the batteries. They don't have the know-how. They don't have the talent and they can't move at the, at the proper speed. Like there, there are moats around all of this. And then that's just talking about the vehicles themselves. We're not even talking about the idea of the supercharging station, the network. I mean, we're not talking about any of this other stuff. So this is what he doesn't see. And this is why I think he, it's, it's like he's just so conflicted internally. Like part of him is like, well, this makes sense. It's going to go up. The stock's going to go up. I wouldn't short it. But I think it should be $250 price target. He, he's got something going on. And it's a, it's a, what is it? Dr. Dr. Hyde. I forget what it was. It's great. I remember the book, but he's got something, a demons inside of him that are just conflicting. So hopefully I covered everything I wanted to in that point, but there's a lot he said there. And a lot of things that it's very clear that he does not understand. 
Let's continue. So, so just to be clear, Craig, you're not calling for people to sell. You haven't got a sell rating. So, in fact, if that $250 price target was hit in the year ahead, it, you would be wrong because you're not telling people to sell the stock. What I'm saying is it's egregiously overvalued and that I think that people well, are far better you've got a neutral rating. Off. So the neutral rating is, is saying don't short it. So you have a distortion in the market. Tesla's valued at more than the rest of the automotive industry combined. The increase in the share price today on an equity basis was almost equivalent to the combined equity value of both Ford and, and General Motors. That's shocking. These are iconic brands making actually far more money than Tesla. I'm going to stop them right there. So first of all, it is not a distortion. Again, if I took Motorola, if I took BlackBerry, if I took Nokia, and I told you I add all of them up, but Apple has a bigger market cap than them, you would say, yeah, that's a no-brainer. Of course they do. They have a whole different product that's next level compared to what they have. They have old technology. This is Windows 95, essentially, that we're dealing with here versus what Apple OS is, right? It's the same thing, all right? Ford and GM, yeah, they're iconic, iconic brands, but you know what else was an iconic brand at one point? Sears and Kmart, and where are they? Amazon has wiped the floor with all of them. So this idea of an iconic brand means nothing, right? Tesla is the new iconic brand. Now, the idea that these companies, these iconic brands are making far more money than Tesla, what are you basing this off of? Are, are you talking about strictly just revenue or, or are you talking about bottom line? Look, Tesla essentially has no debt, no debt. So everything they make is essentially all profit. These other companies, have hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars in debt. Now I know a lot of the naysayers out there can be like, oh, but they have their, they have all of their uh, leasing agreements and they have all the vehicles out at the dealerships and all this, and you can depreciate and you can count that. And they're at, listen, all of that is garbage. We're moving to a world of EVs. That's where the value is. All that's garbage. So to sit there and say that, <laughs> that they're making more money, it, that's no difference than me saying, hey, I have zero bills but I make $50,000 a year. Yet Joe Schmo next to me makes a million dollars a year and has $1.2 million in debt, in, in, in bills every single, every single year. Joe Schmo is 200K in the hole. He's not making more money than me. On paper, I guess revenue, sure. But once I subtract everything, all, all the bills, he's in the hole. Meanwhile, me, no bills or anything, $50,000 a year, I'm at a 50K surplus. So you got to be very careful. Right? These analysts like to be sneaky with these terms. Now, I would also like to add in here, uh, just to go back to the whole Toyota thing and they're selling 9 million vehicles and all that. It's also, here's the other thing people don't understand. Margins matter, all right? If, I'm, if, if one company is making 3 million vehicles, I make 1 million vehicle, but I make three times the amount of margins as that person with the 3 million vehicles, that's essentially a wash. We're making the same thing, but I'm just more efficient and making more margins with it. And that's what Tesla is. Think about this. Do you think that average selling price of a Toyota vehicle is $50,000? Because that's what it is for Tesla. If, in fact, it's probably higher at this point, right? All my models, I use about $48,000 and that's extremely conservative. I don't think you can even get a Tesla for 48 grand right now. So th these, these, points that they make they're like these little they're not wrong yes toyota has more vehicles sold but it, it, it you, you got to be more nuanced than that at what price right at, at what margins okay they make more revenue okay but what is it look like what does it look like after all expenses are paid how much debt do you have on the books right like that all matters this is why financial literacy matters and i don't understand what the logic is for all these people, all these analysts who are, they're not idiots. They know these things. I don't know why they come on and just spew all this stuff without proper nuance and due diligence. Let's continue. That have, you know, really interesting, and I would say almost exciting electric vehicles coming to market. Exciting electric vehicles coming to market. Do you see his face? This is the man that we're going to take. Look, I'm just saying, look at him. Like, is this someone that you would be like, hey, man, tell me an exciting thing that's going to come out in the future. You look like somebody who's going to know what the future is and what an exciting product is. I'm just saying, this isn't the guy I'd be going to. You know, I'm just saying, it's all I'm saying. And, you know, really, there's, there's two points. There's two points to, to make from this, right? 
One is demand is tremendous, but everybody faces the same demand. Demand is tremendous for Tesla. We don't yet know if demand is tremendous for everybody else. For the Chinese uh, EV companies that are coming up, yes, I would agree. They have tremendous. NIO has a lot of demand. But for Ford and GM electric vehicles, we don't know if demand is tremendous. We don't know that at all. What we know is that they're battery constrained and they're chip constrained, and so they can't make vehicles. But we don't know that their demand is tremendous. Tesla has a tremendous demand. They have a year backlog. They're producing as many as they can. They, can, they have a production problem. They cannot produce fast enough. Ford and GM, they also have a production problem in the fact that they can't produce anything yet. So to say that there's tremendous demand, everybody has the same demand is incorrect. Absolutely incorrect. Both those conventional OEMs, as well as the emerging OEMs that are all introducing electric vehicles. Musk has done a great job getting out front, but demand is fantastic. People want to own these vehicles. And I would say, actually, I think that there's another key point, which is the traditional automotive industry is probably underinvested. I, this is what I'm saying. Like This guy's... I think he like smoked a crack pipe or something before he got on here. So on the one hand, he's saying there that Tesla is completely overvalued and, and that it, it makes no sense, their valuation and all that. But then he says that Musk has done amazing, that the demand is tremendous for electric vehicles, not for ICE vehicles. Yet his whole comparison is that Toyota is selling 9 million vehicles a year. And it just makes no sense. Tesla's evaluation and then again, he comes in here and now he's going to start talking about how the OEMs, the traditional OEMs have egregiously under invested into these new, into this new technology. And then he has the audacity to go back and, and to start off this interview saying that Tesla is overvalued. Is, which one is it, man? Like, which one is it? It can't be both. It's one or the other. If you look at the valuation Tesla at a trillion dollars, you know, a big multiple versus Toyota, which has an order of magnitude more sales. You know, people have been overly focused on the wrong things. The last time it was sexy to work in the automotive industry is in the 1950s. People have not been focused on the wrong things. Analysts like him have been focused on the wrong things. And that's why they have lost money in arguably one of the biggest bull runs of any company in the history of, of, the, la of the last 150 years. Like you have missed out on all of this. You've been wrong the entire time. So people are not missing. You are like, that's, that's gaslighting if anything. And you know, in the last few decades, people have been talking about pensions and stranded assets and the benefits or, 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 or impediments of union labor and distribution inefficiencies. These things all become irrelevant when you have compelling portfolios that deliver profitable vehicles that, that, that are what consumers want. And I think that there's no reason that many of these companies can be very successful introducing vehicles and having people buy them in the millions over the next few years. Tesla's obviously going to be in the millions pretty soon, um, which means there's a distortion. Yeah. Tesla's overvalued. Would I short it here? No. I think he's got some tricks up his sleeve. I think Musk is a great CEO, and he's really transformed the automotive industry. I think that whole last one or two sentences just sum up this entire interview he wants to be a fan of tesla he might be a fan i mean you can see it coming out you can see the smile on his face when he talks about elon or tesla but then he wants to go back and say that it's overvalued and on the other hand he wants to talk about the oems are so underperform uh, uh, under invested about pensions and all that like it's this guy is so conflicted. I've never seen something like this. And I, I love that uh, the interviewer, I, I don't know why I can't remember his name. Uh, I, I watch him just about every day. But it's its hilarious how he calls him out on, so if we hit 250, but you say don't short it, then you were wrong. This is a wild interview. But I hope this helps get you inside of the mind of what's wrong with these bears. And you can see that they're slowly starting to see it. And so some of it is starting to like, it, you can see the gap being bridged almost. And I wish he, he would watch this interview because then he would get my analogy of 9 million flip phones versus a million iPhones. That's what we're talking about here. That's the same exact analogy. I mean, I can't think of a better analogy, you, you know, and now on top of that, you, oh, the iPhone selling for how much? way more and how much margins meanwhile these flip phones are selling for nothing and that's why they can sell so many at volume like these things matter and none of them seem to get it they just think it's another 
you know, sheet of metal that's bent to look like a car and they don't see what actually matters, the battery technology, the software, all the other things, the ancillary. I mean, it's crazy because we live in this world of the software age where everybody talks about stickiness, right? Stickiness, stickiness about getting a product, getting another product so people become dependent on it, right? Whether it's, you know, things in the enterprise from a, a software perspective or even your own house, right? You get you get an Apple laptop, you get an iPhone, you get some AirPods. Well, now it's sticky, right? You're, you're in this ecosystem. That's the same thing Tesla's doing and you don't even realize it. You don't see it. It's wild to me. But... For all of us investors, all of us Tesla longs, we love this. We love this because days today, days like yesterday, where we see the stock run up and it's still extremely undervalued in my opinion. Like I've been saying, Tesla today should easily be a $2,000 stock price and I think we'll get there this year. But it gives us an opportunity to keep dollar cost averaging, keep buying in. And you know what? Until everybody sees it, it's just going to be a bigger opportunity for us. At the end of the day, you want to get invested into a company before everybody sees it, before all the move is done. We are in early innings. It's early times in Tesla. It's exciting times. Anyways, I just thought that this was uh, worth uh, reacting to and just kind of get inside the mind of these naysayers and just show you the, the silliness of this and why maybe you hear certain things and you, you might fear, because I fear this, that maybe I'm in an echo chamber and just hearing the same things, but... You know, when you hear someone like this and you just listen to it, it's it's literally like he's he took the wrong pill. He didn't grab the right pill from Morpheus and he's stuck in this matrix of a paradigm of an idea of what the automotive industry and the automotive evaluation should be. He needs to move on from that. He needs to expand his scope, free his mind, as Morpheus would say. All right. With that said, we're going to leave it there today. Do me a favor. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Ring that bell. I love you all. Have a good rest of the week. I'm excited to see what this open looks like. Peace.